Welcome back to H20. In this section, we want to talk about time, timekeeping, and how to relate time between two different reference frames. Now, let me start with a quote by Albert Einstein. Everything should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. So let's start with this in mind uh, and recall that uh, we ended the last section by finding that you know, the wave ether model doesn't really describe electromagnetic waves uh, very well. We see that there is a uh, problem between the experiments, specifically the one by Michelson Morley um, and the theoretical picture people had in mind. So Einstein approached this um, in a interesting way. He simply postulated the things he thought need to be true. He said the same law of electrodynamics will be valid for all reference frames where all laws of mechanics hold good. This is the principle of relativity. The second postulate is that light is always propagated in empty space at a velocity c, independent of the state of motion of the emitting body. So with these two postulates, we will now derive the theory of special relativity. And again, we'll start by talking about time. So time is suspect. And I alluded to this already when we looked at Galilean transformation, where we simply out of our intuition assumed that time is invariant. Now, when we now uh, talk about time, the, the, the viewpoint I would like you to have is that we want to look at clocks from different reference frames. And we want to investigate whether or not events happen simultaneously or not. What does that mean? When we make a statement like a train arrives at seven o'clock, what we mean is that there is a, a simultaneous, two simultaneous events happen. One is that this little um, clock here shows uh, to point at seven and 12, meaning that it indicates to us that this event indicates to us that it's seven o'clock. And the second event is that the train actually arrived at the station. So those two events happen simultaneously. The question now is whether or not two observers, one stationary and one moving, agree with this observation. And I'll take it away. The answer is no. There is a relativity of simultaneity um, meaning that two observers can very much agree on the description of two events, but not necessarily that those two events happen simultaneously. So let's investigate and we we'll use our two friends, Alice and Bob, in order to have this discussion. All right, so we start from a situation where Alice and Bob are both stationary. Alice is on her spacecraft and she has a device on her spacecraft which shoots light or paintballs uh, towards two clocks. And each time this happens, the clock ticks, right? And we just look at one situation. So she has a clock on the left and a clock on the right. Bob observes Alice's clock and he can compare Alice's, this observation of Alice's clock with um, his own. So in this stationary situation, there's a TA and a TB. Those are the times of Alice and Bob. Uh, both are zero. This is when the situation starts. And the capital T indicates for uh, Alice and for Bob when they observe that the clock has been hit. Um, I should add here that when we talk about observation in this entire class, unless I make a, a very explicit exception to this, we don't consider the fact that observing actually means that light has to be emitted from the clock and enters Bob's eye in order to, for him to conclude that there was something happening. Uh, the observation is uh, like taking a, uh, an instantaneous picture. Okay, so we have to keep this in mind. But in this simple situation, nothing is moving. Um, you can hopefully agree that the, um, the times being read uh, for Alice and Bob on the left and the right clock are all the same. Now we go in the second situation where we use the same device, but with a paintball. So now Alice moves and Bob is observing her. The, she moves with a relative velocity V and shoots off the paintballs with a velocity U. The velocities will add, meaning that, you know, they, and those two clocks are initially synchronized. So there is an, a 
small t a equal small t b equal zero. Once the clock hit, you can hopefully agree that uh, Alice and Bob will agree that their times when the left clock and the right clock hit are the same, right? But now we want to enter the situation where we use light. So we use a phaser in order to do the very same. So Einstein just postulated that the speed of light is constant, is C, and it's the same in all reference frames. And it's independent of the emitter, which means that we cannot add the, add the uh, velocities anymore. So the velocity um, as seen by Alice of light is C, the velocity of light of the same light by the moving observer Bob is also C. So here we can conclude that the times for Alice, for her, the, the situation is stationary, both clocks will hit at the very same time. Those two events, clock one and clock two hit, are hit, are simultaneous. While for Bob's, this is clearly not the case. You can see here, you can see here that this, this lagging clock is being hit first while the leading clock is hit a little, a little while after. So if Bob and Alice now meet and they discuss whether or not those two events happen simultaneously, they will disagree. For Alice, those two clocks were hit simultaneously at the same time for her, while for Bob, um, the first clock was hit first and the, second, the leading clock was hit, hit second. All right, we can conclude the two events can be simultaneously to one observer, but not to another one. This is rather confusing, and we will see and use this fact a few times later on when we discuss uh, the famous paradoxes of special relativity. So let's look at this uh, in a concept question to just make sure that we're all on the same page. Again, we discuss here diagram three, Alice moves to the right, Bob is the observer, Alice fires her fire, so phaser at times equal zero. Um, then the situation unfolds. At time TA, capital TA, Alice observes that both clocks are hit. At time TB1, Bob observes that the left clock is hit. At time TB2, it's the right clock. Which of the following answers is correct? So here, you want to stop the video and think about which of the answers is correct. So moving forward, the correct answer is number three, where TB1 is smaller than TA, is smaller than TB2. So again, the leading clock lags. The leading clock has a larger TB, which means for that clock ticks a little slower. And again, the two events that can be simultaneously to one observer, Alice in this case, but not to another, Bob. All right, let's look at clocks a little bit more and design an optical clock. So here the situation is as follows. We have two mirrors in which we inject light. The light travels up and travels down, and that's what we call one clock tick of this optical clock. The length between the two mirrors is L. So for Alice, she has this clock in her hand and she can happily observe you know, the ticking of her clock. Okay, Bob observes Alice's clock and compares it with his own identical clock. Um, there's a relative speed between Alice and Bob, and that, that's V in X direction. Now the task for you is to relate the clock ticks, which are observed by Bob, and the ones which are observed by Alice in Alice's clock. So again, stop the video and work out the algebra. The answer is going to be, again, surprising. So if we do this now, we um, find this picture. So we calculate how long does the clock tick take? The light has to travel 2L with a velocity C. So the clock tick is 2L over C. The length can be expressed as C times T delta TA over two. For Bob's, the situation is a little bit more complicated and we have to use Pythagoras in order to uh, calculate, calculate the length. So we define that the length the light has to travel is D, then the delta TB as Bob observes this, is two times V over C. Again, for Bob, the light travels with the speed of light. Einstein just post postulated that. And then we find the length as expressed to the, to the time as C times delta TB over two. 
the length in x is simply given by the relative velocity v times the time it takes for the clock to tick, v times delta tb. So then we can express d square, d square via l square plus x square over 4 and use those expressions here. So we just use this for l, this for d, and this for x, and we find this expression here. All right. And then we solve this for delta tb, and we find the relation between delta tb and delta ta, and can uh, find that it's 1 over square root 1 minus v square over c square, which is the Lorentz factor. So we just, with a simple clock and Einstein's postulate derived um, time dilation. You find that for uh, Bob, Alice's moving clock moves slower. Great. So again, gamma is 1 over um, square root 1 minus v square over c square. We often use, uh, in short, beta as a relativistic velocity. Uh, it's unitless uh, and defined as v over c. Um, gamma is always greater or equal 1. And it's mostly 1 for everything we observe in nature. So uh, in, in one of the p-sets, and also here, I invite you to simply calculate values for, for gamma for things you might think are fast moving objects. So we start with a fighter jet. Uh, we look at the International Space Station, the Earth around the sun, a particle which almost moves with the speed of light, and the proton at the Large Hadron Collider, which is only three meters per second slower than the speed of light. So again, stop the video and work out, work out those numbers. You will need a calculator for that. So if I do this, I find for this very, very fast F-15 fighter jet, which moves with 2,680 kilometers per hour, that the number for gamma is 1.0000000000000, which is 11 zeros, three. So we find this very, very uh, small number or number which is very, very close to one. Situation for the International Space Station changes a bit, only nine zeros. For the Earth around the sun, the Earth is really, really fast, it travels a long distance. Every year you travel once around the sun and you know, every year you get older, you have a lot of mileage on your back. Here you have eight zeros. Particle which moves with 0.9 times the speed of light. Here the gamma factor is very different from one, it's 2.3. And the protons we have at the LHC, they have a gamma factor of 7,000. So you see, once you get close to the speed of light, the gamma factor um, approaches large numbers. And that's where our relativistic effects really are visible. 